Hello and welcome back to another talk about Doctor Who. This week we are going to be looking at season 26. Don't forget, if you like this or if you don't like this, still click like and still click subscribe. Join in below. We do read your comments. Uh, so if you've got your ratings, you agree, disagree, put it in the comments below. Um, I'm P Bell still, and I'm joined by. Hi, I'm James. And hi, I'm Jason. It is lovely to see you both on this spring, summer afternoon evening. Paul, I'm loving your new background and your little, your new little Dalek prop there. Yes, this, this is Rustique. He has come all the way from Scarrow to control the world. Well, it, I'm, I'm just, well, Rusty's really disappointed now because he's no longer the only Dalek on the block. Well, you've got to get move into the 80s because that's what we're doing today. We are. Smooth. We are. Smooth. Very smooth. And we kick off with um, actually the lowest rated episode up to that point, um, Battlefield. Who wants to start on Battlefield? Who could want anything more than Merlin, Excalibur, and the Arthurian legend to kick a good season off, eh? Yeah. Well, BBC One viewers, I think, probably. Is that cool? It's a proper old good start to the season, this one, isn't it? Um, you've got the Brig, you've got Bessie, you've got Unit, you've got a fantastic cast. And quite frankly, it's a stormer of a start to the season, in my opinion. Yeah, I, I, I really love Jean Marsh in this. I think she's she's brilliant. It's more game. There's some some really big characters, like you said, the Brigadiers in there. Angela Bruce uh, is in there as the as um, Winifred uh, Bambera. Again, another sort of big personality. Uh, really fun story. The whole idea that the Doctor might be Merlin in a future sort of carnation as in, incarnation as well is quite a nice little tease. Um, so yeah, there's a there's a lot going on, and I like this story. I think what I would point out, maybe that slightly disagrees in the situation, the, the the bold blistering start, which for me is actually amazing. It starts in a garden centre. I don't think Doctor Who had been to a garden centre before, so the opening. Is the Brigadier buying a pear tree, I am led to believe? Yes, absolutely. I mean, for me, it was, wasn't that exactly the opening scene I was referring to, but the whole story is an element, which I think is really, really good. But I, uh, I, I like the fact that you're channeling Garden Centre there in the background as well. Exactly. You, uh, you, can't, you can't see my azaleas from this vantage point. But the Brigadier, you get to see his when he's putting his pear tree in. And, and I like that. He has got a lovely house, I have to say. It's really uh, quite a, a nice little place he's got. Cool, I'm loving the unit pension. It must be something, mustn't it? Mm. Or is Doris incredibly rich? <sighs> or did he, did he marry into money? It, it's, it's a whole box set to be discovered, isn't it? Um, and also, I mean, the other thing is that it's the last TARDIS scene, I believe. We get the last shot of the console room in the, in the classic series there. You do, and I think it's, it's, it's actually really darkly lit, if I, if I recall. And it's, it, I think, sets the entire tone of how we're going to go with this season, because this season's so much darker, isn't it? Yeah, I, th I think um, in, in context, Battlefield is slightly anachronistic with the other stories, isn't it? I think Sophie said that um, because of the order of recording, I think, is it Fenric, then Battle, that it's, it's yeah. a very odd character thing for her because she's very much sort of season 25, boom, bang, boom, bang, a bang, whatever you want to call it, before you get that character sort of arc that follows in the next few stories. Um, but it's quite honest in being a romp, I think. Yeah, and it doesn't, doesn't hold back from that either it's it, it's there's there's a you know the the authorial legend is, as jason said but you've got quite a lot of you know fight scenes there's the uh the big battle around the nuclear bomb for example you know there's some big set pieces uh, and then you've got these sort of wonderful scenes with uh the doctor and morgan you know it's, it's a really good mix of things that are going on and also, um, 
it's it's good. It's, it's a very multicultural cast. There's a lot of um, nods to UNIT being an international organization. Um, it feels quite forward moving in that aspect as well, which is, which is a plus, I think, for it. Nobody else agrees with me or disagrees with that. I mean, um, the, cast, the casting of the Brigadier as well, that, that's, that's an amazing, you can only imagine that the forums, if there were such things in 1989, would probably have been horrified at the situation as they often are today. Oh, you couldn't have cast anyone better than An Angela Bruce, in all fairness, as, as Bambera, could you? I mean, she's she has brilliant on screen. She's utterly bonkers anyway, but she's brilliant on screen and, and, and I think is great when she's playing up against Nick. I mean, Nick, what can you say? Um, Eve's just on such top form throughout the entire story. Are we yeah. glad it wasn't his last his last stand? Are we glad that, that, that they don't kill the break? No, I'd have, I definitely wouldn't have. Um, I definitely wouldn't have liked that at all. Um, and had they done that, I think it would it would have been a really really bad ending. Um, I'm glad they shied away from it in the end. Mm. And of course, Jean Marsh and Nick Courtney uh, both were in the Dalek Master Plan. So this was this was sort of you know their reunion on screen from that story. She 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 kills Nick, doesn't she? In Dalek Master Plan, she does. brother and sister. It's all coming back to me. I'm like Celine Dion. It's all coming <laughs> back to me now. Um, yeah, I'm Jean. Fair play to her in that she's got a bronze breastplate and a long ginger wig on and she still gets away with it i mean it's the right again i think we spoke last time about um susan engel it's the right side of camp i think it's bigger than you'd play a drama but it's, it's not taking the piss out of what you're doing this is a very honest performance i think oh properly evil camp though and very quotable camp. Let us teach them the limitations of their technology. <laughs> oh, the nails. The... Get, get the tab. I mean, it's quote city, this story is, to be honest. Yeah. And I've, I've got to say, the, um, the destroyer um, costume as well is just so well designed. And I just love um, that little bit where um, the destroyer's been freed and he rips open his chest like this, rips the netting away and it's all bare chest destroyer when he's in full. Do, do, do you know what? If I was going to pick one moment in the story that I thought you'd enjoy, I <laughs> probably would have erred on that, actually. Uh, it, it surprises me. I'm surprised, surprised myself, to be honest with you. I mean, I don't, I don't think at all I'll be mentioning anything about soldiers when I get to the Curse of Fenric. A bare-chested demon to... hungering. <laughs> um, but again, I just love the way that um, Nick just springs into action and goes bang, 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 and shoots him five rounds rapid and all of that. I mean, it's proper, again, just proper brigadier. I mean, I would say it's the Destroyer feels slightly underused. He looks incredible. It's an amazing costume. It's a great performance. It feels slightly like he's, he gets the cliffhanger for three and then he's in part four and he's sort of gone. It's like, oh, could have done... I mean... In my research on this, I do gather that there was a bit more Destroyer in earlier drafts mm. with a zombie army, which would have been quite grotesque. Um, but it does feel a shame that, that given the effort that was you know, made on it, that it, it doesn't get a bit more screen time. Yeah, the prosthetics and the, the, the drooling face is really good. I really liked the, the look of it. And uh, like you say, shame that it's not on the screen for that long. Uh, in the end. No, definitely, definitely underused. Um, I actually am a big fan of Sylvester's costume this season. This is the proper dark Doctor costume. The, the change to the dark chocolate jacket. Yes, I just think it's a nice change. It's my favourite of the of the Sylvester costumes, actually. Uh, out, of, out of the three? Yes. Oh, I suppose I suppose the greys are very sort of summery look and the, the, the browns are moving to autumn if he's a fashion conscious time lord. True. Uh, it's a great thing as well about this story is also I think that Ace gets a companion, so to speak. Ace, Ace and Joey, yeah. that's a nice, nice way of splitting her story off so that you can have the Doctor and the Brigadier and sort of go down that avenue. Um, again, shame, wait, well, why, why haven't we had the show Young Adventures yet from Big Finish? Waiting, waiting to be written, isn't it, basically? 
Um, but of course, it, this episode also saw um, Sophie have a very near miss, didn't didn't she, with the um, the water tank that shattered. Yeah, and, uh, she had to be hoisted out really quickly from the, from that stunt. I really struggled to watch that scene actually when it plays out because I obviously we've all seen the behind the scenes clip, but I really struggled because I know it, I know it was going to happen or did happen behind the scenes. That is so scary, so close that. So you don't struggle because literally she runs into a cupboard, turns around, stands still and says, it's a dead end <laughs> and waits for a, a glass thing to come down in front of her. Almost as if time is almost up on the episode. And you know, I'm just knowing what's going on behind the scenes. I bow to your superior behind the scenes knowledge, Jason. Well, I'm so glad you do. <laughs> You don't see you don't see the smashed glass though until the, the next part, do you? You don't the cliffhanger goes, but then when they do the next shot in the next part, that's when you can see the the shattered glass. So it, yeah. it is quite yeah, it is quite scary, quite a brave stunt. So I think we covered all that. I mean, the, apart from Bessie, lovely to see Bessie back, obviously. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. As I said at the top of the piece on this one, the Brig Bessie unit. I mean, cool. we had it all in this story, didn't we? Eh? I mean, I haven't dropped it down to whether you prefer uh, Mordred or Anselin, because I just wouldn't, wouldn't like to be that shallow on a video. Um, so are, we, are, we, are we raised to vote on the story? Yeah. Story? Have we got our scores on the door to Battlefield? Yep. Shall Who's I go? Go on, go for it, James. So uh, I scored Battlefield 8.5. I'm going with the oh, fractions the, this week. The, the decimals are back. <laughs> We're thrilled by the decimals. Oh, oh. Pinch my decimals. <laughs> so, Jason, uh, at risk of anything else being pinched, what, what, what's your score for Battlefield? Well, actually, you know, I, I like this story very much. Um, and I'm absolutely the same uh, score as James. I'm using the fraction Ooh. and I'm going for eight and a half. Eight and a half. This is unprecedented. Um, Battlefield. Now, I know that some people do find this to be a little bit of a Marmite story. I think it has its, its fans and it has its detractors. So... I am going to give Battlefield, dramatic pause, eight points, no fractions from me, eight points Ooh. solid, which surprisingly gives Battlefield 25 points. That's a good start. That's a strong start. That, mm -hmm. that's, that's an unlikely thumper of a start. Um, will, the, will the standard be maintained? Um, we move to the next story broadcast, which is the last story recorded, and that is Ghost Light. Who's going to, to delve into the darkness of Ghost Light? Uh, I'm sure I will start with Ghost Light because I, I like Ghost Light. It is a bit strange, and I know that it is, I'm going to use the word Marmite episode again. Um, you know, as some people do. <laughs> Do genuinely not like it as much but I, I think there's something quite sort of it you start to see the doctor's manipulation of ace more directly you you just alluded on our last story about you know the story arc for ace and here you see the doctor deliberately getting her to confront a, a you know a section of her past um and you know it, it's all in sort of I know the sort of Cartman master plan, you know, originally they, they wanted to have an outcome for Ace and it, it's supposed to be him training her up. And I think there's there's something quite cruel in this instance that he's taken her back to some something in her life that she, she felt really uncomfortable about. Um, but that being said, you know, the whole idea of this house where everybody's nocturnal and you, you, it's quite scary, you've got, these animals that come to life and start making noises. Um, 
I remember watching this the first time round, and my first impression was, I've no idea what I've just watched. And the second impression was, but I quite liked it, and it was quite scary. So I, I am a fan of Ghost Light. Jason, are you, are you a fan of the Ghost Light? Well, um, I, I wouldn't want to use this very overused phrase in, in, this, in this video, but this is, in fact, my Marmite story. Um, and I came in, I came into rewatching this um, with a little bit of trepidation because um, it had been some time since I saw it last and I wondered how time was going to have treated it for me. So um, it was really good to go back and do a, a, a rewatch of it um, to be able to talk about it today, which is kind of good. Um, what can I say about this one? I think Mark Platt's script is well conceived. Um, but I think part of it for me is that I just feel it doesn't transit as smoothly to the screen as it should do. Um, I think it's got a very, very dark tone, lots of gothic horror at play. Um, I think it's a great example of how well studio stories can be visualized um, if it's done well, designed well. So I think the whole setting's right. And I just love the whole pretext of um, Gabriel Chase being a part of Ace's history. And I know we explore it a couple of times in, in this season. Um, and obviously the, the bit that this is out of sync, because obviously this, this story gets a bit of a mention in Curse of Fenric and it's all out of sync slightly. But I think it was great that we got to explore that. The Doctor's menacing side, or not menacing side, but he's certainly darker in, in character, very much more so in this season. So, um, I think for him to take her there and, and make her confront that, um, I think I'm not, I don't know that I'm altogether comfortable with it, but yeah, it's a, it's a, it's an all round good story. Um, I just don't think it's a classic in, in my opinion. I think um, the story, once you've done the novelization, seen it on DVD seven times, watched it on Blu-ray, watched it on VHS and read a synopsis and heard the author speak is quite simple to get. And it is essentially just, it is just that there's a, 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 an experiment and it's the cataloging and all, it, 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 I understand the story. I think that's fine. I think there's nothing wrong with having a complicated story. The thing that really struck me, um, perhaps unkindly, and I'm willing to take that, is watching it, I thought, what the Jeff would people be thinking if they thought, I'm not going to watch Coronation Street, Doctor Who, I love Doctor Who, I'll just tune into Doctor Who, and they put part two, even part one, if they went for part two, how long would, would, would someone who hasn't got a knowledge of what is actually happening here, how long would they have stopped with it? Because it's, it's a lot of very um, bizarre things. I mean, I, I, think, I think the elements of it, I sort of think, is like a gallery. There are so many beautiful parts to it. It looks gorgeous. The cast is incredible. Um, everyone is doing such fantastic performances. Uh, Sylvia Sims is really scary. John Nettleton, even when he sort of has to become the, the ape man. Uh, everyone is doing such an amazing performance. I do not think there is a bum performance in it. They're all incredible. But they're all little pockets of incredible. And it doesn't feel to me that it molded, that it, it should be the most amazing story. The direction is incredible. Lighting, for once, it's, it's dark. It looks like a horror story. If it was just a, a fairly basic sort of alien-trapped ghost kind of scenario, it would be so much more engaging for me. But I found myself sort of thinking, oh, there's, there's a lot of talent here and there's a lot of quality here, but it doesn't feel like it's going together for me. And that, and that sort of hurts me more than if it had just been badly done. Do you think if it, because it's only three episodes, and those three episodes do rattle along quite quite quickly, do you think that it, it would have benefited from having four episodes and fleshed out some of that? Because there's quite a lot of extra scenes. When I was watching the Blu-ray, there's quite a lot of deleted and uh, scenes or extended scenes. Do you think that would have made it better? I, I personally don't. I think if it had been an episode longer and a little less in it, it would have been better. Um, I know uh, people do love this, and I understand people who do, lo do love this. And they love the style of it, and they love the, the complicated narrative, and it's not like I'm sat here, you know, watching Love Island and don't get what's happening here. I just don't, don't think it works as well as it could do, or maybe thinks it does. 
I mean, blessed. Whenever we have one of the cast that's signing, the first thing they say is, oh, we had a great time doing it, darling. Don't know what it was all about. So, I mean, it's kind of a measure to their, their success that they, they did so well performing. Um, I mean, gosh, if you, you look at Control, Sharon Juice's performance is Control. Crikey, O'Reilly, how do you approach doing that? And to do that with conviction and still with the gradient she does it is incredible. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Um, you know, right from the first time you see her right through the, the story, it's a proper Eliza Doolittle thing going on there as she as she develops in the character. Um, the character of Light, I didn't, I, I just don't know that I, I got the, I don't know if I got the character. Um, and I, I don't know, I think you could have, you could have delivered the story without, without the character of Light potentially at the end. Um, I'm not sure. I think the, the interesting, I suppose, is the casting, isn't it, there in some ways? Because John Hallam was always the, the oh, I, I, and, 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 he, and he does it with this sort of yeah, angelic voice. I think at the time, fairly concurrently, he was in EastEnders, wasn't he, in prison with Dirty Dan? Am I making this up? Um, I'm testing my soap knowledge there now. Um, so I, I, I don't think the character, I mean, because basically it's, it's almost the Zal like isn't it, in that he turns up and then they just say, you know everything you believe, yeah. and then he's gone. It's kind of, it, it's a similar sort of thing. I mean, within that, I mean, some of the some horrible stuff. I mean, the police, the policeman turned into soup and dissecting the, 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 the maid and uh, it's all kind of it's graphic stuff. But then the reverence turned into an ape as well. So you, the, there's quite, you know, there's, there's quite a lot of dispatching going on in, in sort of weird and wonderful ways. When we get a fight, Catherine and, and Sophie have a... <laughs> <laughs> You know, I, I would like to say it devolved, but I, I think it's probably evolved. <laughs> Is that your marmite banana? It's my marmite banana um, to, um, in honour of this particular story, because I've got to say the scene where Matthews does turn into an ape is probably one of the most disturbing in the whole, in, in the whole story. Mm. <laughs> That's such a different video. Um, I mean, the interesting thing is it's studio bound and, and uh, I mean, there's one exterior shot, isn't there? But it is studio bound, but I don't think it suffers from that because it's a really incredible looking set. I think, I think you, you could go with that being a proper house. It, it looks great. Oh, it's, it's an amazing set. The only bit that I think is, is slightly um, juxtaposed is the, is the spaceship set underneath in the cellar. But otherwise, I think the, the whole thing is just, it's just a fantastic piece of um, studio design. I think um, my overriding thought, which is not going to win me any popularity contests here, is it's slightly like, to me, it, it's the Kate Bush of Doctor Who. Lots of people love it and there's nothing wrong in loving it, but to me, it's a little pretentious and underwhelming, and it could be so much better. I'd rather have the Sunita of Battlefield than the Kate Bush of Ghostlight. And I think, I think, you know, take from that what you will. All I can say to that is, wow, wow, wow. <laughs> was, was that one of her screamy songs? I wouldn't know. I don't, I don't know her. <laughs> so, do we have any further points on Ghost Slide, do we think? Or are we happy to move on to a score? Uh, happy to move on. Yeah, I think I'm happy to move to a score. Have you finished your banana? Not quite. I'll finish it now as we're doing the scores. I'm worried you've got cat food when it comes to survival now. Is it, is it <laughs> not all thematic? <laughs> no, there's only one visual gag in this, uh, in this I think, today. <laughs> So, so, Jason, what is your score for Doctor Who and the Ghost Light? Okay, so I, I have a reputation for being quite hard with some of my scores. Um, and I don't mean this score in an unloving way, because I actually think that there is a great... There's a lot about this story that I like, um, but there is some bits that I just don't think worked um, as it came to the screen. So I've um, opted for a 7 out of 10 for Ghost Light. Do you know, for a heart-stopping moment, I thought you were going to say, well, there are three episodes to this story. 
No, I was going to cry. I, I could only use that scoring mechanism for the power of crawl. Justice for crawl. Justice for crawl. <laughs> James, what, what, what are you giving this out of turn? Uh, I like Ghostlight. It's not as 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 good as Battlefield, I don't think, but only marginally. Um, I love the shift in sort of tone for the story. Um, and I give it an eight out of ten. Okay, drum roll. Um, I honestly, honestly would love to adore this story. I would love to. I mean, Frank Williams, Sylvia Sims, Ian Hoff, Michael Cochran. Oh my word, it is it is possibly one of the greatest Doctor Who casts. And yet, if you said to me, put a story on, I I don't think there's going to be a day where I put Ghostlight on. I honestly don't. So, oh. sticky buns at the ready here. It's three parts. <laughs> but who, who would apply logic like that? It's three parts, and I'm going to give it four. Oh, I'm shocked. Oh, audible gasp. I've sort of put it in the colony of space. I've colony of space that I have. You have. I it's half I'm... the length and half the fun. <laughs> I thought I would get some hate with my score for four for the power of crawl, but I think you've reached new lows there, P Bell. I was going to say, I'm, nah. <laughs> I'm always looking for a new low. Always. <laughs> Now is a good time to remind people that you can comment underneath. <laughs> comment underneath. <laughs> Say something nice and I'll get an account and answer you. Um, we move on to our penultimate story of the season, which I'm sure I have something nice to say about, and that's Doctor Who and the Curse of Fenric. So I, I'm loath to go to Jason first because it's a lot of soldiers. So should we go to James first and see what he's got to say? <laughs> Top of my list, a lot of soldiers. No. <laughs> <laughs> but there were a lot of soldiers in it. <laughs> um, I will start with the with the guest cast, because I know we were just talking about how good Ghostlight was. This this entire season has got some absolute brilliant um guests in this. You've got Anne Reed, who would later go on to play, you know, Plasmavore in, in current Doctor Who series um, but you know she, she's the nurse and sort of plays a background role. Nicholas Parsons you know brilliant in this role as the as the vicar you know the, the brilliant cast uh, a real ensemble piece and that's before we even get on to talking about the soldiers for Jason I'll leave that to him to talk about. Um, I wasn't going to mention them as it went. <laughs> Of course not. Um, but again, you've got another manipulation of Ace. And, and this time, that manipulation is coming not just from the Doctor. So you've got, you know, in the last story, he was trying to get her to, to relive that moment of, of burning the house down. And in this one, it's about her, I'm going to say hatred, and it might be too strong a word, but hatred for her mother. I mean, she does say, I hate her in the end. But, you know... Um, there's a sort of huge manipulation going right back to when Ace started um, in, a, in her first story. So you have this sort of culmination of this long story arc. You've got these chessboards that have been popping up in different stories. So it, it's a really interesting story. The backdrop to the Second World War as well. Uh, you've got the ultimate machine and how they're cracking the code and they're planning to use that as a as a weapon again you know there's brilliant storylines going on here and all outside you know the shop locations on the on the army base as well um some some great great stuff i'll yeah. shut up now yeah i mean i mean I, i'm gonna echo a lot of what you've what you've just said um the richness don't of echo it all though because people will switch off <laughs> no, I, i'm gonna just bring my own spin to it as i always do and i'm gonna try not to mention soldiers because quite frankly um well i mean that's a real positive that's worth a, that's worth at least two points on this story before we've gone anywhere um but the richness of this story for me shines out really from the very first scene it's film like um and you know you have got 
Ian Briggs's script that is beautifully realized, in my opinion, by the director, Nick Mallet, um, who I think, you know, this is a good, this is a good one where I think you've got four parts. I know they've done the, they've done a, a, a sort of a longer version, but the four parts really work well for me. It's very tight. Um, it's, it's just got an epic sort of feel right from the, right from the get go. Um, I absolutely adore Ace's outfit in, in this story. Um, it, it is superb. And I'm going to go with the cast. I mean, anything that's got Anne Reid in it for me, being a big Coronation Street fan, anything that's got Anne Reid in it is, um, is going to be a winner. Although I feel slightly underused during the story. And then you've got Dinsdale Landon, who, you know, as, as Dr. Judson is, is brilliant. And then he really notches it up a level when, when he sort of is Fenric for, further on in the story. I'm going to go spoilers here, I'm afraid, but that's how it works. Um, the only thing I think that for me was a bit of a downside, I found the Hemovores just a little bit of a letdown from a, from a monster perspective, but um, a very, 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 very solid story. Um, interestingly, um, I'm, I'm nearly 40. I mean, I'm willing to admit this. Um, so the first Doctor Who I can remember watching on television is Time and the Rani, and I would have been about four. So... Doctor Who, I know we'd, we'd ha occasionally have one in the house and, you know, house them. Curse of Fenric is a story that I watched on, on, on broadcast. I can remember watching it on broadcast that I'd have been about seven. And having such horrific nightmares because of it. It was bloody horrible for a seven-year-old kid to have these creatures that that you sort of couldn't stop, that would come out of the sea, that would just want to drain your blood. I mean, it's, it's, you, you, it's a sort of move on from you sea devils, isn't it? It's, it's horrific. And I know when I sort of got it back into watching Doctor Who again, you know, with the repeats 92, I was still kind of wary about wanting to go back and watch this one because it's, it's a, probably about as full on sort of horror, I think, as Doctor Who... I mean, you get elements of horror, but I mean, this is kind of monster horror, I think, that you, you don't necessarily normally get. It isn't like you can stand there and shoot a Hema War and you're done, or you can you get the bazookas in and you're done. It, 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 you, you've got to have some kind of, you've got to have faith to faith to faith, as um, George Michael might say. So it, it's, 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 it's sort of dark and scary on that point. And, and so I've always had that kind of haunted association um, with it from the nightmares that gave me kid um i mean i didn't know until i've seen recently the fog i mean fog there's a lot i think that is i don't know whether it's is it kind of say borrowed or alluded to maybe yeah i don't have you guys seen the fog one of my favorite films and and mm. the, there are there are quite a few shades i think there are but yeah uh, you know and that's fine there is there is literally nothing wrong with that um, I think the inverse of the last story, insofar as actually it's a very clever story on screen. And if you've read the novelization, which, which I have, um, there are so many threads that you, you don't get on screen that are expanded in the book that you aren't, you, it isn't to the detriment of what's shown on screen. So Anne Reid, obviously, I, I completely agree. It's, it's, it's sort of like she, she just basically wheels him in and out and then gets drowned, uh, gets, gets, gets you know, blooded, doesn't she? Mm. It's all kind of like, crap, what was she there for? And then, of course, in the book, she's a, she's a, a Russian spy and there's a bit more to it. Miss Hardacre, there's the story of her having a, a, a baby, you know, baby. and There's a lot, and Judson and Millington, obviously, their relationship. There are so many layers that, that are expanded on there, but it, it's incredible that... I think you get that on screen, but without, without having to, you know, go, you've got a lot on screen that isn't like, you need to watch this 14 times and read the book and have an interview and now then you'll understand it. it it's, it's, it's enough there. Yeah. Um, slightly concerned that Ace doesn't know what her granny looks like. Yes, yeah. a bit of a plot hole. You would expect, you would have expected her to have, um... To have known that unless of course um you know she didn't really have anything to do with it because the word is you she did hate her yeah she hates she hated her mum but so she must have had a relationship with her mum for a, a period of time up until the point where she went to work in ice world so i, I mean 
unless she was orphaned, unless her mum was, you know, it was the war, she might have been sent away. I think, I think if this were the case, it could have come out in the novel. Yeah. Too late to rewrite that now. I don't know. <laughs> I, it, is a, it is a slightly trivial thing. I mean, it, it, obviously, if she'd walked into the, the, the base straight away and go, I hope it's grandma, the reveal later on would have been absolutely <laughs> screwed, wouldn't it? I mean... Um, <laughs> It's a bit back to the future. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I, um, I, do, I do think that this story serves us up some of the best scenes, I think, I, I, I've seen between um, Sylvester and Sophie. Um, mm. You know, the, the whole, the Doctor goes full on evil towards the end there and, and destroys, you know, her belief in him to, to obviously um, bring the story to the conclusion. Obviously, he's having to do it, but still has to. But that scene in itself is just so strong. And I think with this season being stories where I think she's being really, really tested, um, I, I just think that scene in particular just stands out. I, I always think that this story and the next one, and I know it's the last one on the next one, really sets up the new version of Doctor Who. The, the template is almost there. You've got a strong female companion that, that stands her own ground away from the Doctor, who's, who's, you know, like you say, been tested, been manipulated. That scene where she sort of very subtly seduces the soldier to buy some time, you know, she just goes and she says, just trust me, you know, I can do this and then just goes off. It's a bit of a weird scene, but you know, she sort of seduces him very, sort of very efficiently. And, and, and I, I just think you have this really strong character coming out that allows, you know, Sylvester's doctor to be darker, to be, you know, um, time's champion, if you like, as he goes on to be. Um, and, and she holds her own against that. And, and it always, for me, when you, when you watch Rose and you see the Ninth Doctor with Rose, that kind of relationship is now embedded. It's, it's, it's different to some of the traditional um, companions in that way, for me anyway. Yeah, I mean, you, you sort of couldn't imagine Dodo saying to that Doctor, I'm not a little girl anymore and seducing her way into Votan. I mean, mm. Things have things have moved. The 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 the, the, st the, 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 the style of the companion has moved, and yeah. I think I think that's probably why, maybe unfairly, there was a lot of hatred. I think at the time for Mel because Mel was very much seen as this is a 1960s thing that she's she's not she's not kick ass. I mean, actually, retrospectively, she, she is a little bit more kick ass than you give her credit for. But I think because Ace was very much of a you know, gun ho. I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna punch. I mean, even with the, like the hemophore stuff. I mean, when she, she mm. does the climbing down the, the church and she has the fights with the hemophores. You know, she, she's, she's feisty and it's, it's a sort of a, a more positive thing. I think it sort of helps. I think propel the story forward. Um, yeah. How do uh, Gene, Gene and Phyllis? I always have to go for Gene and Phyllis. <laughs> I love Gene and Phyllis's characters. They come into the water. Um, I love Gene and Phyllis, and it's a really horrible story in a lot of ways, isn't it? Because they're, they're sort of disaffected. They, they, they're stuck with, with a horrible old woman who's, who's obviously bitter, they're young and happy. And, and then they basically get turned into vampires and then they get rotted. It's, 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 oh, don't be such a baby doll. <laughs> don't be such a baby doll. I think, again, that's, that's, that's probably more um, affecting because... Essentially, there's sort of it's like the show Young Ace thing. They're Ace's friends, and so it's sort of what Ace could have done or could fall into. And I suppose the progression of her character means that she doesn't want to go swimming with them. She doesn't do the the water. Um, do we think um, Nick Parsons is a triumph as a as the vicar, or do we think it's a, an odd cast? I like. I, I really do like his character and I think he's a good cast. I know the the McCoy era is very good at casting sort of well-known people at the time into these roles. You know, think of Ken Dodd, for example. Um, it 
and sometimes it doesn't work. Sometimes it's a bit jarring, and it's just they've just hired a name for this. But I think he, it works really well. And and you were saying about being scared, and I I think the scene where he is killed, that for me was the probably one of the most sort of grot grotesque bits because you you're like it's Nicholas Parsons, and you know he's he had this crisis of faith he's suddenly got his faith back and you think oh he's going to be he's going to survive and then they sort of twist it and go oh you know you're you're upset about the british bombs and then suddenly he's dead and you're just like oh how could they do that it's like national treasure almost you know that they they've killed off uh, i i think it it works really nicely for me yeah i think it was i think they they really did gamble quite a bit through the McCoy era with some of the guest stars that they brought in. I mean, you can't, you can't fault the casts. The casts alone in this particular season um, are so rich. Um, and, you know, you know they, they put Ken Dodd in Doctor Who and, and, and I remember the derision that that got at the time. And, you know, again, Nicholas Parsons, big entertainer, you know, we're going to the next story with Survival and, and Hale and Pace. And you've, you, you have to forget about them as they are in their in their characters or in their real in their real personas and look at them in the character. And I do agree with you, James. I think he played that character really, really well. I agree. And the official commentary, they get him to stop on for an episode after he's died, which is confusing, but all the more welcome for it. Um, yeah, it, 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 I mean, it's a bloodbath by the end. I mean, I think it's sort of, sort of I, you get the battlefield, you get a lot of the soldiers that kill slightly, you know, more for the sleep. But um, Curse of Fenric literally come episode four, that's it. I think there's, there's a handful of people that, that get through it, but everyone else is, you're done, you're done. Um, do you think it, do you think that makes it an uncomfortable show? Or do you think that, that's, that, that shows the reality of the dangers that sort of face? No, I, I think um, I, I'm not one of those that looks at the end of a story if, if the characters don't all make it through and think that, you know, that's, a, that's actually not the way that should have ended or what have you. I think this story needed a very strong ending. It's a great story anyway, but it needed that strong ending. And, um, you know, it's epic. Again, it comes back to what I said earlier on. It's, it's epic. And they've gone for a, they've gone for a, they've almost gone for a blockbuster type approach here. And they're throwing everything at it by the time you get to episode four, you've got, you know, people dying left, right and center, but it's all part of the narrative and it's all part of the strength of this particular story. So no, I, I don't think it, it, it does anything into the detriment of the story at all. No, me neither. I think it's, it's set in World War II, so there was, you know, sadly, a lot of death going on anyway. So I think this is within context. I think it's it's not incredibly shocking that so many people die. Obviously, it's, it's a high body count, but um, no, I think it's okay. There's the horrible scene actually just prior to Nick Parsons, isn't it, where they, they seal the door off and the, the, the two guys are banging on the thing and he's like, you know, there was a fire in the engine room. We heard them screaming for hours. And it's like, oh, that's, I mean, it's cold. Um, mm -hmm. Also, I think one of the other creepiest parts is um, the underwater filming is incredible on this. You don't get that very often, obviously. The underwater stuff is really good. And the marine and his eyes opening and all that. It's, that, it's, it's, it's horrible. I mean, water's always a bit. And so the bodies underneath and the hands and all that, it's, that's so well done. Um, Did anyone feel that the ancient one was a little bit of a letdown? Yes, a little, a little. Um, uh, especially if he, if he kills off all the others, you know, and dissolves all the others, and then it, it was kind of like, and now what? It, I, for me, it felt more of a plot, a bit like the Destroyer in the last one. It was kind of like, well, we we've added this character in. He's got to do something more functionary, but that, that's just how it felt a little bit. Yeah, it, it, it's, it's, I suppose the problem with an improbable story and not who's always sort of improbable is you've got to find a probable resolution to it. I suppose mm -hmm. 
it is slightly the same thing, isn't it? The ancient Hema war basically goes, do you know what? I probably, probably got this all wrong. And <laughs> let, let's end it all. Um, yeah, we, we were thrilled to see um, the ancient Hema war as Hillary's boyfriend in May to December quite recently. So it was a career after that. Um, so are we are we happy to give the curse of Fenric some score? Oh, just 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 before I give my score, we haven't spoken about Super Ted. Super Ted Gate. <laughs> well, I remember seeing an interview with Ken True, who said that they meticulously researched this situation and that the the bear that appeared on screen was was an accurate bear for the time, but. Um, I'm not really. I'm not sure whether that's that's just just bamboozling. Super Ted, <laughs> obviously, Super Ted came through the time storm that Fenric yeah. used to trap Ace. Yeah, it was it was one of the wolves of Fenric. They, who knew? Super Ted is a wolf of Fenric. <laughs> you heard it here first. I'll never watch it in the same way again. <laughs> exactly, and, it's, and John Pert. It's all linked. <laughs> Um, it's meant to have happened. So, Jason, what? Now, can just to clarify here, you can't give a point for each soldier because we're going to go over ten. <laughs> <laughs> no, I can't. And I've been very well behaved and not mentioned them at all, but I, I do believe they've added a little bonus to the story. Um, you know what? This is a, 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 it is a classic. And I don't, I don't, I'm not going to bandy that word around. It is a classic. Um, Ace got her fun in the water in the end, so I'm going to give this story a nine and a half. Nine and a half. You could, couldn't quite write that ten. I give the tens out when they need a ten. This isn't quite a ten. It's very close. That's why it got nine and a half. Okay, James, where, where are you going for the Curse of Fenric? I feel like Jason's been reading my notes. Um, because I also gave Curse of Fenric a very commanding 9.5. Well, 9.5. But do you know what? I think you're both incredibly mean not to go the whole hog here because it's never <laughs> too early uh, for a 10 from Shirley. I'm giving Curse of Fenric 10 points. Well, well there we go. Well, well. well. It's all the leftover points from Ghost Light. It's just carried forward with the time storm. So that gives um, Curse of Fenric 29. Uh, it's a very, very impressive score. Um, that's not our highest score yet, is it? Uh, yeah. The demons. The demons Demon. came out on top. It had a full house of 30. 30, didn't it? So, so our second highest. So it appears we like demonic forces, I guess. <laughs> we do. And, and I feel that's the, saying more about us than it is about the show. <laughs> demonic forces and some lovely soldiers. That's all we need. It's true. And anyway, let's. <laughs> I, I'm genuinely hoping that Jason has got a tin of cat food now because we're going to do survival. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to disappoint you, I'm afraid, because I haven't. What a letdown. What, it's the owners I blame. <laughs> This is the objects I blame. And I've got to say, um, my Lord, that cat, that animatronic cat will live in my brain for a very long time to come. I'd forgotten quite how special that animatronic prop was. Um, survival, back to Perryvale once again, um, which never seems to work out terribly well, but um, yeah. it's survival of the fittest. And do you know what? This is, this is a story that sets itself up well in the first episode. Um, the scene where the guy's washing the car and you're not quite sure what the danger is. You've got the cat and you, you know the cat's somehow involved, but you know the scene with the guy washing his car and it sort of ramp, he's, you know, ramps up the tension a little bit. You know, to have Anthony Ainley back, um, I think he played it really, really well in the story. It's clear the master's in, in some really serious trouble um, and he... I think he comes in and, and, and gives us, I think, one of his best portrayals um, of, of the master, I think, um, throughout. Where have we got? We've just got, you've just got everything here. You've got the cheetah people, 
you've got some really you've got some really menacing themes at play and you've got a really really good set piece right at the very end it's a great story i actually really like this i think um i think russ steep would agree actually here that um it is probably but anthony amy's best performance in it. It, it, it it's it's maybe the most muted performance but it's the most convincing and it's probably the most menacing uh, it's slightly sad that it's it's the last time he gets. I mean, we're going to forget the Destiny of the Doctors video game, everybody here. But it's 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 a shame that that is his sort of goodbye to the series now because he's, he's he's finally sort of hit that point where it's menaced, but it's not the full, <laughs> you know. Um, and he fits well into the story. It doesn't feel actually like he's been dropped in there because some quite often I think if you bring someone like the Master back, it feels like you've been given a story and they've gone, oh, oh, um, Anthony's got four episodes next year. Do you want to put the master in there? And they've gone, oh, all right then, okay. Uh, whereas this feels like he's very much part of it, um, which, which is, you know, a good thing. Mm-hmm. You can disagree or agree. I don't no, I, no, I absolutely, I yeah. I, I think in this, this story is the, the master that, actually I wish he'd been most of the time um you know I think he was a bit sort of campish supervillain in his very early days and here you get him as a sort of desperate older wiser master who's look he's he's he is evil you know he's not you know afraid to kill someone off to get what he wants but he he is very uh like you say controlled and I think it coming up against Sylvester's doctor, who by this point is, you know, not exactly the the lightest of doctors. You know, he's got his dark side. Um, it's a really good match. You know, the the bits where they are sparring with each other and then they end up fighting, I think is really, you know, that was my image. My image was Sylvester over him with a, you know, bone in his hand, about to clock him one. Uh, that was on the, I think that was on the VHS release you know and that was you know just that that sort of moment there where the doctor almost crosses to his side and then pulls back i think is really really a uh, strong moment big it's scene strong visual. sorry jason so it's a very strong visual that um and mm. you know, again real peak of the story at that stage um you know uh, just just superb yeah, and he stops himself, you know, he, his eyes change and he, he, he realises and then, you know, you've got that that big sort of thing where he just goes, no, I can't, I can't do this. And, and, and that's really good. Um, I have to say, when I was reviewing this story again, this is, um, you were saying earlier on about how, um, Paul, you were at school when these stories were on. So I was a little bit older but still at school watching these and and the, the the animatronic cat which i know is much much maligned and misunderstood for you know when you're a kid and you suddenly think oh my god if i see a black cat i'm going to be transported away to some you know uh strange planet with killer cheetahs there was there was really something there and again i said i mentioned earlier about tapping into um you know, your, the, the new version of Doctor Who, the sort of 2005 onwards version, is it, taking something quite mundane, something every day, and turning it into something quite scary and, and different. And I think for, for lots of kids, black cats suddenly became this sort of like, oh, my God, is it watching me? You know, and if a cat passed in front of you, we're like quite nervous about it. Yes, the animatronics were not exactly brilliant. Uh, but I, I thought, you know, for the time, it, it was very good. I didn't have any problems with that because um, after the nightmares of Curse of Family, I was banned from watching it, so <laughs> I didn't get to see it. Bad <laughs> face. Um, Animatronic Cat turned up, didn't it, on Twitter quite recently. It survived, it's been sold, mm. and it's, it lives. Um, I, I think it's funny because... Um, Available, obviously, through the Phantom website, there is a survival commentary from Who Talk. Um, and Rona said the last thing, because she lived in Scotland, so she, she was sort of telephoned me, she said the last thing she said to Alan Waring was not puss in boots. Whatever you do, not puss in boots. 
So she said the horror I sort of think of seeing as seeing the realization of the GDP bill was like, oh, because there's the vision. And they, I imagine how much, I mean, the money, and, and but it would have been incredible had they just been basically human people with vaguely cat, like the, the eyes or just, just features rather than the full, I've got a cat hat, a cheat hat. And I, you, it's a shame because they're kind of sensual characters. The, the gist is that you, you, mm. you turn into them or they devour you. And it's, it's a very sensual thing. And you can't really do sensual in the furry costume and the wellies. It's... But would you, would you rather have that or the CGI from the recent Cats movie? Oh, that's an unfair question. <laughs> I'm not. I'm not sure. I, I'm convinced that it would have made it as a musical. I mean, as much fun as that would have been. Um, it's the owners I blame. I mean, it could have been. I, I did have to laugh at the in joke um, with the cat's poster on the on the yeah um, shutters in the youth centre, um, and I couldn't get I couldn't get the songs out of my head after I saw that again this time. <laughs> Um, I mean, again, going back to sort of the run of the theme with Ace, is that you get you get her her crew, don't you? Really, you get get a lot of her friends in this one, which gives her a bit of context, um, um, which is great to see. And they're all really well played, and it's, it's it's a nice part of the story, I think. But then you get her development in you know her love story, if you like, in this one. There's a lot of undertones. With Kara, isn't there? <laughs> yeah, there, there are. I mean, there, there's, there's, I, I think again, the vague problem that you, you get with that is 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 the costume. I mean, Kara mm. costume. Imagine if it had just been a, a very attractive sort of half cat sort of person looking. Mm. You had that moment of this is this isn't. I just don't know whether you could necessarily desire that that cheetah costume. I mean each to their own, but it's, it, it, is, it is a shame because it's, it's a great part of it and it's a, lot, it's, it's, it's a great and it's a very forward um, narrative on it. Yes. Um, and again, it's nice, it's nice that obviously we got to a point where it could do that, um, even if not everyone understood that that's what they were doing. I, um, but I mean, obviously, I mean, the big thing here as well, news-wise, I suppose, is that Lisa Bowerman's brought to the world of Doctor Who. Mm. I mean, yes. If nothing else, survival gave us Lisa. Yay. That's a yay. That's a definite yay. And, you know, when the when Kara, the character, sort of dies and, and you get the reversion back to um, sort of the actress Lisa, um, again, I just it's little touches like that in this story that I think um, it just... It, for me, that was a really nice touch. I, I haven't got much more to add other than it was a really nice touch. Um, yep. Alan again, great direction on it. I think um, I'm right, it's a double bank with ghost lights. So you have half studio, half location to the mix on it. Um, yeah, great. I love the music too as well. I, I, again, one of the things watching Ghost Light, I'm not going to keep kicking Ghost Light. One of the things when I watch Ghost Light, I was like, can we have a little less music? It's killing me. Whereas Survival, I, I love that and the electric guitar and stuff. It's actually very atmospheric. I think it really adds to the to the, to the dynamic on it um julian holloway as well uh, again that's that that's i suppose slightly you could almost say it was in the nick parson bracket because because he's probably more famous for carry-ons and stuff like that and he does a great turn i think in survival and what's your feeling what about, about what about hale and pace yeah <laughs> what about hale and pace um i don't actually mind i mean I wouldn't say the pitch is entirely where I'd want it. Uh, I mean, the publicity must have been great. I guess it was a good thing because you can get your newspapers going, Hail and Bays and Doctor Who. And, uh, it, 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 it's not a triumph of pitch, but it doesn't upset me. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't watch that. I think, oh, God, don't ruin this for me. Um, in the same way, because didn't they want um, Blitz and Dibber originally from French and Saunders were all asked to do that, right? Like, Kind of, Were they? Oh, didn't know that. Couldn't have gone well. Um, no, I don't think. I don't think it upsets. I, I don't know whether it upsets either of you. Um, 
No, it's more of a, it, it's just an interesting talking point. I think it's it, it's not badly casted. Um, and they're only on screen for, you know, a minute or so. It's not, um, it's not offensive or anything. It's... No, they don't, they don't distract. I think um, they, they could have been a danger. They could have really overplayed it. And they mm. didn't actually, because the characters of Len and Harvey would just, they just, they would just played it. They played it pretty straight, to be fair. Um, and no, they didn't, they didn't over, they, they didn't overdo it. And I think that probably um, wasn't as bad as I, I would have thought it could have been when I first heard about the casting. Because um, I am, um, I, I can remember it well, being broadcast uh first time round and um i was in that age group where you know stunt castings as i would have called it back then or you know these sort of these sort of castings that were a little bit out there um i was never that particularly comfortable with um back in the day yeah I, ironically it's, it is part of that sort of going forward to the new series which i think it's fair to do at this point is that what was stunt casting in the 80s is casting now that that is how you 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 naturally build your cast up you get these different sort of people and nobody sort of bats an eyelid to it um the, the great character i think um one of, one of the unsung doctor who supporting characters ever Ange. i love Ange. <laughs> we thought you had died or gone to birmingham <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I, I mean, if there's a summation, it's great because you never really get that kind of context, do you, when someone goes travelling with the Doctor until you get to the point where Rose goes and they do think she's, you know, gone missing. Or whatever. You don't have that kind of reaction to, oh, well, Sarah Jane, where did you go? It is like, and, and to have that just that deadpan thing of, you know, you died all gone to Birmingham because it's not dissimilar. Um, so Angie's a great candy, and it's such a small part as well, but it's, it's, it's great, lovely pitch, and, it, and it's, again, it's a bit more colour whole sort of situation um the ending i think i sort of would say i've got to mention the ending it, it's because it, it's not rona is it? it's andrew who wrote the last speech as they go off through the bush it's a beautiful end i mean you sort of couldn't have written something that, that's just sort of if that was it that's a great ending i think mm. and what i didn't realize until i watched the extras on on the dvd yesterday was that was actually performed on the 23rd of november 89 so it's the 26th anniversary that that recording was was made to to put on to the end it's quite sad quite quite sad at that point to realize that that would be it for for many years or was it all those new adventures books, all well, those many stories, too too dirty and too long for the big screen. Which I adore. I do love the the new adventures, but it for the for the for that to be the I, I for me personally, this is one of my favourite seasons. And it's sad that it was the last one, you know, to, to come to such an end um, as it did it is quite sad. And I remember being absolutely gutted um, as a child that that was it, you know. Um, it, it, does other... feel like, it does feel like it's hit a point, doesn't it, where it's actually, oh, we know what we're doing now. We've had yeah. a bit of a, we don't quite, and I think you get that sense, I think, I think you get that feeling from when it's taken off with revelation, where there isn't actually anything wrong with the situation. They've been told there's something wrong with it. And they come back to try and fix something that they didn't really need to fix. And they're, they're sort of floundering. And then, you know, there are good and there are bad within all of the seasons sort of in between there. But at this point, they're like, this is where we're at. We know what we're doing. We know what the situation is. We know how to tell these stories. And it does feel like at that point, the BBC have given it, they've done. Um, I mean, even down to actually looking in context when it was being shown, I mean, 7.35 on a Wednesday, even sort of, it's kind of like, is that your audience? Is that what your family audience? It, it, it's a really, it, 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 was, it was put out to, to, to die, wasn't it, really? Yeah. It was, but um, it, was, it was the wrong time for the cancellation to come in. It really was hitting its stride again. The entire, I mean, I'm, I'm with James, I think this season is extremely strong. Um, and 
you know, it, the BBC has a habit of making these decisions of cancelling things that are that actually aren't as bad as 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 they think they are, and we actually, as as audience, are enjoying them. And uh, you know, El Dorado is a great example. It was absolutely slated, but actually, at the time they cancelled El Dorado, it was actually flying. Um, and this is a great this is a great decision that they should never have made um, at the time. I mean, obviously, it's set in motion the history, and we 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 know about the wilderness years, and obviously, we've got the series we've got now. But mm. you know, it was it wasn't the right time to cancel. There was at least another good couple of seasons, and we were on a good trajectory. Um, the character was was going down a path, and I think it was it was good. It was a great change from where we'd been. There was plenty of life left in it. Do you think that if it had been now, yeah, if that season was now, it would have been snapped up by, you know, a Netflix or somewhere like that? Because we see a lot of series now that are really popular, but, uh, you know, for whatever reason, they decide they're going to pull it, and then suddenly another station jumps in and goes, well, we'll have that. Do you think that would have happened? Um Probably. I think the way things are consumed is sort of different now. Uh, I guess at that point, Doctor Who was a 26-year-old series, mm. but the higher sort of parts of the BBC just weren't interested in it. It, it had always been there, but because it had always been there, it's like a, it's a familiarity, isn't it? It's, a, it's just there and it's back again. And, you know, you can keep hacking the episodes down. I mean, we know at that point, I mean... Red Dwarf was on a bigger budget than Doctor Who. Um, the CGI was getting better. It was getting to the point where actually you could probably do a lot of things that you, you couldn't before, and the storytelling would be easier. Um, so it, I, I guess it is. The, I mean, if Doctor Who were, were cancelled today, I think there would be some format, there would be some company, there would be something they would see the appeal. Yeah. Um, I guess that's the benefit of 30-odd years of hindsight i mean if we hadn't had the cancellation we wouldn't have got dimensions in time so can we just just well, pause? Exactly. yeah oh i can't wait till we chat about that <laughs> <laughs> yeah that'll be a special it's um a <laughs> so are, are we happy i think now to to um give our scores on the door to doctor who and the survival yes yeah. indeed go on then jason Okay, it's three so, episodes. <laughs> it's three episodes. It's three again, really good episodes. You know, we've just travelled through a really great season, um, and this was a good way to end. Um, yeah, we didn't want it to end, but it did. Um, there's, you know, the season as a whole. If I take the story into consideration, there's a definite eight on the table for survival. No, no decimals, no fractions. No, good solid eight here. Okay, James, what are you giving Doctor Who and the Survival? Well, I'm certainly not giving it eight. So uh, <laughs> it's the end of an era and it's a brilliant story. Lots of great undertones, a brilliant portrayal of the master in this one. And it deserves nothing less than a nine. A nine. Mm. It's tense. It's a tense set of scores. Um, I, I like survival. Um, I think it's great. I like it. I don't love it. I think I, I, I think there's, there's a lot to like it, a lot of great performances, but the scripting, direction. But if, if I was going to put a story on, I would be happy to put survival on. Um, so I'm going to give it a solid seven. What am I getting owed for sevens now? <laughs> wow, what, what was this about? Uh, that's like, just, seven, just seven, just just three off a of ten. Oh my, I'm going to go to Gallifrey Base now. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's just how good this season is. <laughs> Apart from well, a right. four for Ghost Light. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> oh. I'm getting trolled on the video. I mean, you better wait to get an avatar and do it after. Um, so <laughs> You've been very harsh with your scores in a couple of instances. <laughs> I gave Doctor Who and the Curse of Fenric 10 points. You did. You did, yes. You okay. Did. Well, that gives Survival a final score of 24. So, okay. 
drum rolling here. Um, our fourth place story is Doctor Who Ghostlight with 19 points. In third place, it's Survival with 24 points. Second place is Battlefield with 25 points. And our winner for season 26 with 29 points is Curse of Fenric. Hey. hey! Do you know what? I think that's the right order. I think we've got it in the right order there. Do you take back now about me scoring harshly? Yes, I do. I, I'm afraid I, I really do take that back. Russ Deek says they're all rubbish because there are no Daleks in them, so... I know, a dalek season. Hopefully the next one we do will have Daleks in it. Maybe it will. Mayhaps, Pex. Mayhaps. Um, <laughs> well, thank you very much, uh, Jason and James, for that. If you enjoyed that, or even if you didn't, click like, click subscribe, and leave your thoughts below. And we'll see you very soon, so goodbye. Goodbye.